Hello and welcome to another episode of Analyzing Mormonism. Today we are discussing the history of the Relief Society. Woo! <laughs> so we have um, slides as usual. And so let's start off with talking about the Ladies Society. Do you want to read this one? I will read this one. Okay. Ladies Society, commissioned by Sarah Granger Kimball, Eliza R. Snow wrote a constitution and bylaws for a ladies' society to sew clothing for those men working on the Nauvoo Temple. This constitution and bylaws were submitted to the Prophet Joseph Smith. These are the best I have ever seen, but this is not what you want. That's from Joseph Smith. Yeah, Joseph said that. Yeah, so I just thought that was interesting. Like, the best he's ever seen, but this is not what you want. And I I don't know. Like, I, okay. Anyway. Like, what, what does he think that it is that, he, that you want? No, you don't want this. You want something different. Um, yeah, so Sarah Granger Campbell um, and then Eliza R. Snow. One thing was interesting was we went to Nauvoo and we were asking about why Emma, why Sarah Granger Campbell was not the president of the Relief Society since it was kind of her idea. Um, and they didn't know the answer to that. Maybe it's just because Emma was more well known. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. So anyway, connected. Not exactly sure, but maybe Sarah Granger just wanted to serve and didn't really want to be in the. I don't know how that conversation went down, but. So on March 17th of 1842, the first Relief Society meeting was held. And it was held, as far to my knowledge, is held in the Masonic Hall in the Red Brick Store. It was held right in that same room, which we've been to, which was mm. kind of neat to, to see it through the eyes of uh, someone who's left the church. I just thought it was interesting. Yeah, so she's been to Nabu many times. It was the first time I'd ever been there. but Yeah, we grew up going. So it was just fun to see it again through an ex-Mormon lens. Yeah. Okay, so another thing that they point out is that the... Well, I'll just just read her. Although the name may be of modern date, the institution is of ancient origin. We were told by our martyred prophet that the same organization existed in the church anciently. But if you read the Daughters of My Kingdom, which was these somewhat, I think it was in the 2000s, 2000, I can't remember when it was published, um, but that, it was like circulating all through the Relief Society. It was a really big deal. But if you read that book, it says little is known about the formal organization in the New Testament. So, so he's like, they're like admit, admitting, we don't actually know if this is ancient. So Joseph was probably wrong on that. Probably account. Stuff up. <laughs> well, and if you read another thing that, is, that I think is interesting, and it's been pointed out by others like David Bakavoy and Dan McClellan, is that Jesus didn't even organize a church when he was on the earth. So those are from Bible scholars. And I just think it's interesting. Why would we know anything about a woman's organization if Jesus didn't even organize formally a church? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a list of names. Of the the uh, of the roles or the what do you call that when you're um, who's present? Yeah, who's present or who they're trying to get into the society in the minutes. So this is just kind of neat. I just love old documents. And then so this is a list. This is the same list typed out. And I also made this next slide to show you the women involved in polygamy and with Joseph Smith. So you've got Emma, his wife, and you've got all these women who are participating in polygamy with Joseph Smith. So like at the time that they're joining this society. Well, not, not exactly. Cause, um, the society did start in March of 42 and some of these women are dated later, but like Sarah Granger Kimball, who started this, Joseph proposed to her. Like there's a lot of other, there's a lot of these women who right around the same time or right before or right after they're getting involved in polygamy. So I guess my point is just that all these women had to keep a secret from Emma. Like, yeah. Yeah. And that, that'll that play in later. Just crazy. Okay. Do you want to read this one? So as for names, as for names of the society, um, Benevolent Society was voted as the name. Emma opposed, though, because she wanted the term relief in the title as it would better reflect their purpose. After discussion, the Female Relief Society was voted as the name. The word female dropped in 1869. Yeah, so just an interesting piece. They wanted the benevolent because it was a, I think that was a common name for the lady societies in the day. But Emma was like, no, we need relief. So that's what. Yeah, because she, because there was another common, like there was a well-known society called the Benevolent Something Society. And it was like corrupt and um, like was well-known for just being like. Yeah. yeah, so I'm sure like she wanted to stick out more and then to be not seen at all. Like, yeah, as you know, not as being like related a, at all. Right, right, right. And then female autonomy. When Joseph Smith organized the Relief Society on the 17th of March of 1842, he gave the women an autonomy currently unknown in that organization. There is ample evidence that Joseph envisioned the Relief Society as an organization for women parallel to the priesthood hierarchy for men. He instructed the sisters to elect their own president, who would then select her counselors. Then he would ordain them to preside over the society, just as the presidency preside over the church. 
Um, so that's so they picked their own president, and the the president was not called by the bishop. Right. Like yeah, is which now. is super interesting. Yeah, it was a very very separate thing from what it is today. So yeah, and which would be way cooler to run for president mm -hmm. of the Relief Society than yeah. to just be called randomly. <laughs> Yeah. And I feel like the women would do a really good job and they would support her better. And they would, I would think that they wouldn't pick people who couldn't do the calling. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and it'd be so much easier on the bishop if the, the Relief Society sisters picked the person, the women themselves. But okay. Yeah. Preside. So Joseph Smith proposed that the sisters elect a presiding officer to preside over them and let that presiding officer choose two counselors to assist in the duties of her office. And let that presiding officer choose two counselors to assist in the duties of her office, that he would ordain them to preside over the society and let them preside just as a presidency preside over the church. Yeah. So just again, this is just a very, he is making this exactly, it's setting up, he's setting it up exactly like the church presidency. So it's just mirrored, but for women. Right. Okay. And then there's this idea of ordained and set apart. Joseph Smith stated that Emma was ordained at the time when the DNC 25 was given in 1830. Elder Taylor, John Taylor, was then appointed to ordain the counselors. He laid his hands on the head of Mrs. Cleveland and ordained her to be a counselor. Elder T then laid his hands on Mrs. Whitney and ordained her to be a counselor. To Mrs. Smith, the president of the institution, with all the privileges pertaining to the office, etc. Also, they call Emma president as well a, a lot in these. Mm -hmm. So they have to distinguish between President Emma and President Joseph, which I thought was really interesting. Anyway, so they're being ordained. And then that's not the language that they use today. Susan Young Gates, who was the daughter of Brigham Young and his 22nd wife and also women's rights advocate, later emphasized that these women were not only set apart, but ordained. Yeah. So again, she's very, she's distinguishing between we were not set apart, like, oh, you're set apart to be the really set apart. She's, they were literally ordained to do these callings. That's beautiful. Yeah. At the third meeting on, on the 30th of March of 1842, Joseph addressed the women and told them that the society should move according to the ancient priesthood. So he's even, it seems like he's even got it in his head that this will be almost exactly like the priesthood, except with women. Because women had the priesthood, and there's no reason why we should think anything different of how it functions. So to changing, changing history. In an official church manual titled Daughters in My Kingdom, published in 2011, I remember reading that in, yeah. in Relief Society, the church tries to remove the idea that these women were ordained with the priesthood. Sister Smith chose Sarah M. Cleveland and Elizabeth Ann Whitney as her counselors. Elder Taylor later set apart each counselor by the laying on of hands to act in her office in the presidency. So they're trying to pretend like it never happened. Right. So like if we go back, and this is from the novel Relief Society Minute book, the actual book that Eliza R. Snow was keeping. And they say ordained. They use those words specifically. And then in this, I don't know if this is gaslighting or what they're trying to do, but they're trying to whitewash or change this to say, oh, they were only set apart. So it's, anyway, and then, so it was 2011. So the same book, they talk about it again and again, how the, how the men have the priesthood. It's the men who have the priesthood and they never allude to the women having the priesthood at all. So these are just a few quotes. The women of the church have united with the men who hold the priesthood to build God's kingdom. The women will work alongside men who hold the priesthood. They now served under the authority of the priesthood. They loved being unified with their priesthood brethren. Like, oh my gosh. And it just keeps going. The Relief Society was, or, was organized under the priesthood authority. Under the authority of the priesthood, the saints were blessed by the power of the priesthood through the laying out of hands by the brethren. They don't talk about the who women doing the it. <laughs> the brethren who held the priesthood um, through the laying out of hands to the elders, causing the sick to be healed, the lame to walk. Never once do they mention the women healing the sick and causing the lame to walk or raising the dead or anything like that. It's just, they totally did. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, 1,331 members happen. So, so by March of 1844, they have 1,331 members. So there's a huge growth uh, from 20 members that it started out with to this many. And Joseph had at least, so 33 of these women were, were his wives. So not all of his wives could be in the Relief Society. And that's another of the things that people wonder if maybe Emma knew. Um, so there was one woman, um, Lucinda Pendleton Harris. I think it was her. One of the girls specifically was never, was, was not allowed to be in the priesthood or excuse me, not allowed to be in the Relief Society. And um, I think it was Todd Compton that the wonders if that's why is because she knew that he, she was a wife of Joseph. It's a and good wouldn't reason. wouldn't allow her to get in. So. And she was like really trying to prove that it wasn't happening. Right. right. That was a big focus of um, Relief Society, which we'll talk about right now. <laughs> 
So Polygamy and Relief Society. By the time the Relief Society was organized on March 17, 1842, Joseph had nine polygamous wives already. I'm not sure what Joseph is referring to exactly in these quotes taken from the Relief Society minutes, but I wonder if it wasn't something to do with polygamy. Not war, not jangle, not contradiction, but meekness, love, purity. These are the things that should magnify us. Sisters, shall there be strife among you? I will not have it. You must repent and get the love of God. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know specifically what he's talking about or what's the background for this, but it would not surprise me if he is, like if Emma's suspicious of polygamy and he's just trying to keep the peace and he's telling them, you know, chill out, sisters. No fighting. <laughs> I know you all want me. I'm everybody's favorite, but you can't, I mean, and you all do have me, but don't fight about it. That's what he's saying. <laughs> okay, so um, so this is continuing on with polygamy. Let This is, this is Joseph talking. Let the society teach how to act towards husband, husbands or to treat them with mildness and affection. When a man is born down with trouble, when he is perplexed, if he can meet a smile, not an argument, if he can meet with mildness, it will calm down his soul and soothe his feelings. When the mind is going to despair, it needs, it needs a solace. When you go home, never give a crossword, but let kindness, charity, love crown your works. <laughs> yeah. So again, I'm not sure if this is polygamy, but that would not surprise me. Um, maybe he's talking specifically to Emma. <laughs> Well, a lot of the men complained that after um, that after they had a second wife, that the first wife was catty as hell. <laughs> yeah, like, and Eliza talks about that a lot, too. Her. There was some of them were like, she is violent. She's never been. She's always been sweet and kind. And now she's <laughs> being violent. In and the Utah period, they would um, sometimes when a man would take on more wives, he would just drive the first wife. He would say, oh, honey, let's go on a date. And then she'd get all ready and she'd be like, oh, my gosh, my husband is taking me on a date, not his other wives. And he would drive her straight to the insane asylum and just drop her off and just drop her off. And that's where she'd be like super bad. Uh, uh, Analyza tells a couple of those stories where the women are just taken. <laughs> I hate that. Yeah. Especially because the same asylums weren't what they are today. Like they don't treat them with medication. They're just like. Just a prison, basically. It's just a prison. Yeah. So. Okay, Emma, Emma and polygamy. After this organization at Nabu, much disturbance arose among the sisters. I do not wish to be personal, especially as Sister Emma is now dead, but, but think that some of those circumstances should be known. Sister Emma got severely tried in her mind about the doctrine of plural marriage, and she made use of the position she held to try to pervert the minds of the sisters in relation to that doctrine. She tried to influence my first wife and to make her believe the revelation was not correct. Sister Taylor was very much troubled there, thereat and asked me what it meant. Soon after, the prophet Joseph was in my house and I spoke to him in my wife's presence in relation to what Sister Emma had said. And Joseph replied, Sister Emma would dethrone Jehovah to accomplish her purpose if she could. Some of you sisters are acquainted with what I refer to and if the and of the prejudice that then existed. Okay, so I should have um, given some background to this. This is President Taylor, and this is later published in 1880 in the Women's Exponent. So he's just he's just saying Emma was really upset about polygamy, and, and she tried she to tried use to, her position. She, well, and you can read that in, in the talks that they give in Relief Society. She's like, don't listen to anything Joseph says um, if it's not oh. over the pulpit. Like, if he's talking to you individually, don't listen to it. Right, right. Uh, like from the stand. Yeah. Which is fair. So because... he's acknowledging. So President Taylor is acknowledging that this is what one of the reasons why Emma used or how uh, one of the ways Emma used Relief Society was to um, stamp out polygamy. So, yeah, she would dethrone Jehovah if she could to accomplish her purposes. Like, wow. Well, that'd be a tad exaggerated. Yeah. Okay. So on March 9th of 1844, Joseph commissioned W.W. W. Phelps to write an article telling the world that the saints did not practice polygamy. And this was called the voice of innocence. And he says, we raise our voices and hands against John C. Bennett's spiritual wife system as a grand scheme of profligates to seduce women. And they that harp upon it wish to make it popular for the convenience of their own cupidity. Wherefore, while the marriage bed undefiled is honorable, let polygamy, bigamy, fornication, adultery, and prostitution be frowned out of the hearts of honest men to drop into the gulf of fallen nature. Where the, war, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched and all the saints say, amen. Well, there you go. We don't like playing me, you guys. What are you talking about? Yeah, that's just where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If I say this emphatically enough, you will know it is true. And this is March of 1844 and Joseph passes away in June, July, June. Can't remember. I can never remember which month it is. Um, but yeah, that's just a few months before he he's martyred. So, but he's like still saying we don't 
we do not live polygamy. So this is later that month in the Navu neighbor. If you want to read it, Navu neighbor. Okay. The end of the Relief Society. We raise our voices and hands against John C. Bennett's spiritual wife system as a grand scheme of profligates to seduce women. And they that harp upon it wish to make it popular for the convenience of their own people. Is this not the exact same quote? It's the exact same thing. Sorry, I should have prefaced too. So Emma really, really liked this. She loved that this was published by Joseph, the commission by Joseph anyway. And so she herself has this put in the Nauvoo neighbor. She like ran with it. She was like, hey, you guys, this is what the church leaders are saying. This is a totally official. She's just repeating the exact same thing that, she, that we already read. We don't believe in polygamy, bigamy, fornication, adultery, prostitution, none of that. So she just repeated it again. Um, like you should. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, so on March 16th of 1844, which is like almost exactly two years later, um, the Relief Society ended. The last recorded Relief Society meeting took place on March 16th, like I said, while the church does not like to admit the reason for Relief Society ending, ample evidence suggests that it was due to the practice of polygamy. It is true that three months later, Joseph and Hiram were killed at Carthage, Illinois, and that three years later, the saints migrated west. But these alone are not the reasons the Relief Society ended. And that's what the church likes to push. And if you read, I think, anywhere on their website in this booklet, in this little Daughters in My Kingdom, they'll they'll always try to say that the Relief Society had to stop because of the everything was happening with Joseph and they had to migrate west. This was three months before anything happened with Joseph, right? Right. It's not, yeah. And to me, and it looks three years before they migrated west. Right, right. So, like, why, why not? And it would have, have been continue? really helpful to have this society of banded together women during these times of trouble. So, right. ending that wasn't smart, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, true. Okay, Brigham's warning. On March 9, 1845, in the discourse to High Priest Quorum, the following was recorded. President Brigham Young spoke, Relief Society going to meet up again. I say I will curse every man that lets his wife or daughter meet again until I tell them. What are Relief Societies for? To relieve us of our best men. They relieved us of Joseph and Hiram. That is what will... <laughs> That is what they will lead to. I don't want the advice or counsel of any woman. They would lead us down to hell. Ooh, that's so bad. Sounds like Brigham Young. Yeah. On the same day, in the Discourse of 70s Quorum, the following was recorded from Brigham Young. When I want sisters or the wives of the members of this church to get up Relief Society, I will summon them to my aid. But until that time, let them stay at home. And if you see females huddling together, veto the concern. And if they say Joseph started it, tell them it is <laughs> Tell them it is a damned lie, for I know he never encouraged like, it. Like, I feel like that's super... Why would he say that? Okay. There, it, like, it's written down in right. the Relief like Society he, notes. His, he was there, and he was not there for just one. He was actually there for a few of them. For a lot of them. Yeah, so it doesn't make any sense. But also, like, he, like he just so... Like, if the, they will not meet again, like, I, I'll Don't tell them. Don't let them, them huddle can... together. So these women... This is in 1845, so this is just right a year later. And uh, from Joseph's death. And so the women are like, we want Relief Society to come back again. I guess we need the prophet's permission. And he's like, hell no. Like, anyway, so the, the women wanted to, like you said, that they could have used this relief during this mm -hmm. time. Like, the women for sure wanted to start it up again or to continue it. And Brigham would not let them. But like, not just the Relief Society. If you see them huddled together, yeah. like that, what kind of control is that? That's a, that's a, not a, that's not a democracy. What is the word I'm looking for? dictatorship that's a dictatorship like in a really really controlling one right but also he's saying the relief society I, I, this is what i'm reading the relief society killed joseph and hiram yeah they relieved us blaming, of joseph and hiram blaming it on them what are relief societies for to kill our prophet <laughs> like well you know historically women um being kept apart um is not good for anybody i don't, I don't know like that's that's why they say that gossiping is bad because it's women who gossip because they will tell each other stuff like this. Like, Hey, your husband's sleeping with all of us. Yeah. It's really bad. So 10 years later at Brigham Young's suggestion, the women started an Indian relief society that lasted from about 1854 to 1858. Its primary purpose was to clothe the indigenous women and children. And there are several quotes from Brigham about this. He's like, I don't want to see people's boobies. <laughs> He's like, cover them up, get them shirts, cover them. Like, that's what he said. I, I should find this specific quote. Yeah, of course, he doesn't use that word, but that's basically what he was saying. Like, to me, when I was reading this again before we recorded this, like, it, this sort of sounds like he's just trying to colonize oh, and yeah. he's trying oh, to, like, 100%. Yeah. 
which like this ew. is much less about um being good and kind and more like we need to either make them work like cooperate with us or they will eventually need to be gone which is yeah. uh, which is what he did do yeah he anyway so genocide. so so no i don't what do i call this there's no mainstream relief society going on right now but there is the indian relief society which it seems like his main concern was to get them dressed so um anyway all right, localized relief societies. So other smaller and localized relief societies began to operate during this time. Largely isolated within local wards or congregations, most of the relief societies organized during this period functioned for four years or less, and sometimes discontinuously. For example, the Female Relief Society of the City Bountiful operated for only six months. Documentation exists for some 25 ward relief societies in the 1850s. These early societies lacked the centralized leadership, organizational procedures, and expanded responsibilities that strengthened and invigorated those permanently reestablished after 1867. Yeah, so it so crops up here and there, and it, it's like goes goes away, comes back, goes away, and in, in just these different words. Um, so it, it seems like they had to be very dependent on the one ward relief society president, and it's not. There's nothing, I don't know, it just seems very unstable, I guess. Do you have any thoughts on that one? No, that totally makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so um, on December 9th of 1867, Brigham Young formally called on bishops to reestablish the Relief Society in every war. So he's saying, okay, we might as well just do this everywhere and make this a thing. It begins again, but only at a ward level, not generally. President Young needed the women's help in gathering donations and in general. So he's like, hey, the women are really good at make, uh, raising money. So let's have, let's establish this in every ward, but we'll not, it's not going to be a, a main thing that we're all it's not a collective thing it's just it's just on a word to word basis sort of like a word book club and they're just all gonna i don't know how else to <laughs> you first started reading this i was like oh that's so kind he's letting them start again and i was like oh he needed money yeah he needed money he needed money <laughs> and the women were i think he was i think he even discusses how women it's easier for people to give money to women um than to the men so wow the newspaper began in 1872 and ran for 43 years until 1915. And like we talked about in our last episode, this is where women are pushing for equal rights. They're pushing for a lot of different things. And this is like, they're totally giving their whole voice to this women's exponent. Like they're being able to speak out and they're not being forced to say what the brethren want them to say. It's, it's very much their own publication. So grain storage in 1876, President Brigham Young put Sister Emmeline B. Wells in charge of grain in charge of a grain saving program in which Relief Society sisters worked together to procure and store grain. In the early 1880s, some of the male priesthood leadership frequently sought to gain control of, of the grain program resources for other purposes. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So she's in charge of it and they start doing, they start getting really successful about, about it, about it, at it. And the brethren are like, um, I actually want that. Like, can we have control over that? Um, it sounds like the Relief Society was the one doing most of the heavy lifting and not the brethren specifically, but. Okay, so in, this is another thing. So this is about medical knowledge in the hospital. In 1872, the women had been counseled by President Smoot to open a school for medicine and surgery for the instruction of females. He went on to ask, why should not the women of Utah take measures for gaining knowledge of the physical organization of the human system, especially that of the females, that the ladies of our community might receive, when necessary, medical or surgical treatment for those of, of their own sex? He also said that, that this endeavor could help women to assert their right to hold public office, which is super cool because he's advocating oh. for women holding office. Um, it is a little interesting how it sounds to me like he's like, um, this is kind of what I'm seeing. Maybe this, I don't know, but he's like, we need women to study women's bodies so that the women can take care of themselves rather than having a male doctor um, yeah. take care. But I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, that's not a bad point. Like women know their bodies better and they know how to, they make better, um, uh, midwives in which there was a lot of babies going around going oh, being, <laughs> just being bastard <laughs> that's not what i mean there was a lot of babies being born and so they need uh, women who understand all of this <laughs> okay so the relief society bought a hospital in 1882 so they established the deseret hospital in 1883 eliza arsenal reflected on the establishment of the hospital with the approval of the first presidency, we commenced the hospital as no other women on earth except Latter-day Saints would have undertaken so gigantic an enterprise, i.e. with nothing. Okay, yeah, that's, yeah. Funding for the hospital came from a variety of sources, including subscriptions, donations from primary children, benefit concerts, in-kind contributions, 
and circulars that were sent to local church leaders soliciting financial assistance. During its first months of operation, the hospital served on average between 12 and 20 patients per month. It's not very busy, but that's kind of cool. Like the like kudos to them for being able to start this hospital. And like they are raising money, they're doing all that they can. These women are like that's that's hard. Like I can imagine how hard that would be to start a hospital. Like anyway, super cool. Uh, uh, then it ends. So in 1894, only after only 12 years of operation, the Desert Hospital closed its doors. According to Leonard J. Arrington, the hospital's demise was due to a number of financial factors, such as that most of the patients were unable to pay for their treatment. So that makes total sense. Like they're only having 12, 24 patients per month, and these people can't pay their medical bills because they have no money. Well, to be fair, 12 to 24 was only the first month, but so okay, hopefully well. it was more. But still... Not being able to pay your bills. That's true. Who's going to pay for this? Yeah. So because we don't have free health care in this country. So yeah. So that's a, that's sad, but like twelve years, that's that's a pretty good time, and I'm sure they helped a lot of people during that time. So okay. All right. A handful of wheat. In 1883, the church leaders wrote to the bishops, "The wheat has been collected by members of the Relief Society in the various wards at considerable trouble, and they are the proper custodians thereof." and responsible, therefore, to the parties from whom it has been obtained. No bishop has any right, because of authority as a presiding officer in the ward, to take possession of the grain. This was still the church policy in 1896, when Wilford Woodruff told Zina D. Huntington Young, Eliza R. Snow's successor as head of the Relief Society, that even the president of the church had no right to take a handful of wheat and dispose of it. So there, he's just reiterating... That this is the women's property. This is their thing. We don't, we have no, none of the men have any right to this at all. So just, you guys have your autonomy and you guys have your own thing. And then we don't touch it. We're not interfering with that. So um, one of the purposes of Relief Society, this is talked about by Eliza R. Snow. She says the Relief Society is designed to be a self-governing organization, to relieve the bishops as well as to relieve the poor, to deal with its members and correct abuse, etc. And I thought that was super interesting that because um, like helping the, relieving the bishops, that totally makes sense. Relieving the poor to help deal with its members and correct abuse is um, a little bit interesting to me. So I just added that in there because what is that? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, yeah, What kind of abuses and how do they correct it? Yeah. In 1901, President Lorenzo Snow outlined the assets, the growth and the ability of the Relief Society as an autonomous structure. You are the only ones among the saints who are doing anything in a financial way against a day of famine. Like I said earlier, they're like the only ones doing anything. At this time, the Relief Society raised its own funds and, and maintained its own real estate, which is super cool. President Snow then listed off what the Relief Society had. It had 103,783 bushels of grain, along with flour and beans, um, $3,331, and, and that it was 30,000 30, members strong, with a building fund of nearly $5,000, with an upwards... Um, and with upwards of $100,000 worth of property in your possession. President Snow promised the women that if they earned the money, they could buy a building for the Relief Society. President Snow died three months later. So he's saying the women are killing it. They have all these things. And if they keep if they keep up this rate, they'll, they, they can just buy their own building for the Relief Society. But then he died. So let's see what actually happened. <laughs> okay, so this is just, I'm just showing you guys like, the bushels of grain, the money on hand, their real estate, how many members, their building fund, like they are killing it. Like so good. And this was in, excuse me, um, 1901. So not that long ago, I guess, or shortly after it started. Like, I was say it was 120 <laughs> like so they, so they started in Nauvoo, died off for 20 years, started again, and then they're just like exploding. That's what it seems like to me anyway. It's because it's run by women who know what they're doing. Oh, wait, is this the, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, in 1909, after the Relief Society had raised most of the money needed to build their headquarters, Joseph F. Smith reversed Lorenzo Snow's decision, surprise, surprise, and reassigned the lot intended for Relief Society to the presiding bishopric, requiring, requiring the women to donate their building fund to the presiding bishopric for a bishop's building instead of the long-awaited women's building. The Relief Society was granted use of a few rooms within the new building to meet in, but as part of this arrangement, the presiding bishopric began supervising Relief Society efforts. This is gross to me. Like, they have all this money, and this the guy said, the prophet said, yeah, we'll give you a building, and they're like, oh, sweet. So now we have even more money. Can we buy this building? And they're like, actually, we're going to take that. We're going to buy our own building, and we'll we'll give you a few rooms. Like, this feels like a bully, like a, like a bully. I don't... 
It taking like somebody's a, lunch like money. A, like a husband who's taking his wife's savings. Yeah, wow. Well. Okay, so in 1913, the motto for their late society became Charity Never Faileth. Good on them to still be super sweet and nice. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't feel very charitable of the brethren to have done that. But yeah, so Charity Never Faileth. Um, the Relief Society magazine. So in 1914, the Relief Society magazine replaced the Women's Exponent and it ran for 56 years until it was discontinued in 1971. So this entire time, they've had their own voice since the Women's Exponent. All these years, they just changed. There's basically, it seems to me like they're just changing the title from the Women's Exponent to the Relief Society magazine. Still, they have their own publication. They're able to publish whatever they want. And at 56 years. So it's a good long time. Yeah. So in 1917, wheat became the symbol for the Relief Society. I wonder if that was a bit of an fu to. <laughs> I don't wait. Hang on. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Okay, so this is where, where the wheat's coming in. So when World War One began, it began in July of 1914, and in their manual, the church says this: the wheat from the Relief Society, the wheat also provided nourishment for thousands during World War One, when the Relief Society sold 200,000 bushels to the United States government. So the women were so good that they, of their own volition, they they sold all this to the government and helped so many people in need. Like, who wouldn't who wouldn't support that? Yeah. So in 1918, the government of the United States of America requested to purchase the Relief Society grain storage to address worldwide grain shortages. Without consulting the Relief Society, the First Presidency and the presiding bishopric sold the Relief Society's entire grain supply, the work of four decades and placed the funds from the sale in an account controlled by the presiding bishop brick, not the relief society. Emmeline Wells now serving as the president of the relief society was understandably upset that relief society assets had been sold without her permission. Bishop Charles Nibley apologized, but also changed policy going forward. The presiding bishop brick would have the final say about the relief society's grain program and the monies resulting from grain sales. Yeah, so if you look in their minutes, they have this noted there. It's like um, they request the or they take the grain storage. It's it's really easy to find. But she, Emily Wells, seems really really sad and hurt because this was this was her work. This was her baby. They've been four decades that they've been gathering all this stuff, all this grain, and they just just swipe it out from under her without even talking to her about it. And she was like so hurt. Like, why did you do this to me? Like, what or to, to us? Like, and it just seems really like this is the church's says now, oh, the, the Relief Society sold this grain. The Relief Society has nothing to do with the sale of this grain in World War I. Like, it was just the presiding bishop where he was like, hey, they have all this grain. They The, the government wants it. What do I do? And they're like, just sell it. Like, anyway, this whole story is is awful. I don't know what else to say about that, but... I wonder what they used the money for. It wasn't for the Relief Society. No. <laughs> Maybe that gave them the leg up on the billions of dollars they have today but yeah in 1923 president heber j grant told the members we wish also to have it clearly understood that all auxiliary associations operate under the direct presidency and supervision of stake and ward priesthood authorities who carry the ultimate responsibility for the work of these organizations so the relief society is an auxiliary association it does not like so it's extra it's unneeded that's what that that's what auxiliary literally means it's like not necessary it's just a a side piece. I don't know. Yeah, so... Why, were you gesturing at me? Am I your side No, piece? I'm just... I'm not gesturing to you. I was gesturing in general. I'm necessary. I'm you not, are. I'm you not are necessary. <laughs> you are necessary. Okay, so limiting the early society. In 1940, J. Ruben Clark had written a memorandum of suggestions and wished the auxiliary to reduce unnecessary activities and focus more on the central mission, building testimony to strengthen the family and help the poor. He asked the Relief Society to pull back from its broad agenda and focus more on the welfare plan. He urged the Relief Society to give up its educational work and leave the merely social, cultural, and educational to other community agencies. So he's like, very much limit what you're doing. He called upon the Relief Society to assume its rightful position as the handmaid of the priesthood. Ew. Yeah. He also discouraged the Relief Society's practice of leading out in independent spheres of activity. Ew, uh, you guys, that you guys guy. have too much power. You guys are, you guys are speaking too much. We need to only speak about this one thing. We need to talk about testimonies. We talk about strengthening the family and helping the poor. That's it. Don't educate each other. Don't. What else does he say? Don't be social. Don't be, do cultural, cultural activities. Don't educate. Like you're the handmaids of the priesthood. You should just be serving. 
like women are supposed to just serve. Yeah. So, um, in addition to the changes Jay Rubin Clark was making, he proposed that the church do away with such magazines as the, as the Relief Society magazine. President Amy Lyman discussed the matter with her counselors, and they asserted that the Relief Society was one of the oldest women's organizations in existence and had long been regarded as the premier women's organization of the church, a companion to the priesthood. As such, it stood higher in the estimation of LDS women than any of the other church auxiliaries. For all these reasons, Relief Society leaders reasoned the organization deserved a periodical of its own. Clark backed away from his suggestion, and the Relief Society magazine was spared for another 30 years. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, but it's still, it's like... The women were like, "Mm, we've been thinking about it, and actually we don't want to do that. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay, fine. Right. But like, why? But also, this is in the 40s. This is 1940. And he's like, y'all need to stop. We need to, I don't know. He's just, they're women. Ha- it seems like the Relief Society has been trying to be silent. The men have been trying to silence the Relief Society since its beginning. So like, yep, that's what it seems like. Yeah. Um, Amy Brown Lyman, despite Clark's message, Amy Brown Lyman, the eighth general president, said in a speech, I would like to advocate the idea of women becoming more interested in politics and government. So she's like, okay, Clark, both local and national, she declared. They should not only vote, but also play an active role in the political process, helping select candidates and even running for office themselves. Go, Amy. Um, In fields where they are um, especially qualified, she included that the Relief Society should be interested in city, county, state, and national administration and finance. In in, In industrial problems and economics, in personal health, both mental and physical, in public health and health education, in the schools and school programs, in recreation and housing. So she seems to be like, F you, Clark. <laughs> like we are, like, we know about. We all absolutely of this want stuff. to educate, and this is all super important. And we need to know about this. Women, we're not supposed to be just like have our blinders on or whatever. We need to have, or like a blindfold on, more specifically. But she's like, we we need to take part in politics. We need to we need to educate ourselves. Like we need to learn about finance and all these other things. Like, yeah. Anyway, the slow shrink of the Relief Society. So in 1944, visiting teachers stop collecting donations and focus instead on ministering to the sisters they visit. In 1969, the Relief Society Social Service Department is incorporated into church welfare and social services. In 1971, despite the efforts of the Relief Society president, the Relief Society magazine was discontinued. Yeah, so they're stop collecting funds for yourselves. Stop your Relief Society Social Service Department. And then stop your magazine. So, like, they're taking away their money. They're taking away their education and all this other stuff. And all their influence. All their influence. They're just... Make it go away. We don't want the sisters to have too much power. Under Harold Lee Lee's correlation efforts, President Amy Brown Lyman expressed concern that women would not want to join the Relief Society if it abandoned its projects. You guys, if we if we stop, if we do what you're doing, no one's going to want to join. And in response, the church made membership of the Relief Society automatic for all females in the church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints above the age of 18. So like, what? yeah, so back then they had to, you had to be voted in. You had to, you have to, I think people had to donate. I think that was a practice. I'm not sure if it was necessary. And people could oppose you from joining the Relief Society. Like if you look in the Relief Society minutes, people said, no, I think Emma kept people, some people out like we talked about. Um, you People had to agree that you could be in there because this is a big group. It's a like a club. And she's like, people, people are actively trying to join us so that they can help with our efforts. And if you stamp out our efforts, no one's going to want to join. So they're like, so he's like, we'll just make it automatic. And then everybody will be part of it automatically. And there will be nothing special about this. Yeah. They gutted it. They Mm -hmm. gutted it. It's just a shell of what it used to be. Correlation. According to an article from ordained women, as part of this correlation effort in 1978, the relief society transferred the last of its assets to the first presidency. 200, 266,291 bushels of wheat and nearly $2 million in other assets. In exchange, the Relief Society would at last be funded by tithing dollars, saving women from the expense of paying for Relief Society programs with additional money. Mormon women would also cooperate with male priesthood holders in the holistic work of the church through the newly established council system. Transfer the last of its assets to the First Presidency. Almost like over 200,000 bushels of wheat, nearly $2 million in assets. And that would have been way more in 1978. $2 million in 1978. Right. I'm going to Google it. Well, and this looks like the bushels of wheat that they were able to get after helping world in World War One. That's a lot to have to be gaining all that. 
So 2 million in purchasing power today is equivalent to nine, over $9 million. That's a lot of money. Like, and they just took it. They're like, no, because they can. Yoink. Their first General Relief Society meeting. This, so on September 16th of 1978, they held the first General Relief Society meeting. And so, and one thing I also wanted to point out is remember that the ERA's deadline, the Equal Rights Amendments deadline was 1979. So this is right before. They're like, okay, we'll give you guys your own Relief Society general conference, like for the Relief Society. Like, this just feels like they're trying to make us, make the women happy. Like, stop asking for equal rights and we'll let you have a general conference. You're <laughs> now Society. equal. You're equal. You're paid for by tithing. You don't have any sources because that's, that's not yours anymore. Don't worry about it. But you're equal. It's really gross. So the 100 150th anniversary. The 150th anniversary. In 1992, despite the Relief Society having been disbanded for over 20 years, from 1844 to 1867, the sisters celebrated the 150th anniversary of the Relief Society by participating in service projects in their communities. I just think that's interesting. Um, the church will still hold that position. It almost like they're pretending like the 20 years didn't happen. They're like, oh yeah, we started in, in 1842 and we've been going strong the whole time. Like... The whole like I had no idea the whole time. <laughs> I had no idea that it was disbanded for over twenty years. Like I never heard that, and I and I've been going to Relief Society since I was seventeen. Like, yeah, or that it's a shell of what originally was. Yeah, like we're all, we're just told that that's how it's always been. You didn't. You never had the priest power. You never. You've never been autonomous. It's called gaslighting. <laughs> Leadership training in 2004, despite having existed as a general relief, general relief society since 1978 for 26 years, the Relief Society, young women, and primary general presidents participate in the first worldwide leadership training meeting for auxiliaries. Okay, 2004. So, so they finally are able to go to this meeting in 2004, 26 years after they started having their general relief society meetings. I don't know. I just thought that was really interesting. Like, oh, now you're going to train us. After 26 years, why didn't you let us, why didn't, why wasn't that a thing before? I don't know. I just thought that was interesting to me. Six million members. In the early church, the women had to petition to become, we've talked about this already. In the early church, the women had to petition to become members of, of the Relief Society. In 1971, the church changed the Relief Society to automatically include any female members of the church 18 years or older, no matter what their activity is in the church. So like, just to be clear, the church is counting some of these people as not being, they're counting not active people at all. Like they could still count you because you have your records in the mm -hmm. church. They probably count my sister. They come and try to get her to go back to church. Um, these women are still part of the numbers for the Relief Society. So in 2009, the Relief Society membership reached 6 million. So automatic, they don't really, I don't know that they have the numbers at all for how many active, how many of these 6 million are active. Just like they don't have those numbers for the 17 million the church brags about for membership worldwide but there's 17 million members and six million of six million of them are relief society members um in 2009 back in how many do you think are children i don't know that's a good question do that's they not question. count until they're eight i don't know i don't that's a really good question because like you can have your baby blessing that means your your records are in the church i don't know how they count those or when they count those Women in the church today. According to an article from Ordain Women, today women may provide input on church finances as they serve on church councils, but may not make final decisions. Women are always outnumbered by men as a matter of policy and remain excluded from many councils altogether. Women are barred from most LDS finance related callings and assignments, such as clerk or auditor. Women can't handle money, even though they clearly can because they raised nine million or two million back in the day. In 2015, the church finally admitted women, or rather one greatly outnumbered woman, to each of three high-level priesthood councils from which women had previously been barred. However, women are still absent from the Council on the Disposition of the Tithes and the Correlation, and the correlation Executive Committee. This is an important oversight, given the impact of correlation on Mormon women... <clears throat> given the impact of correlation on Mormon women over history. Yeah, so they can't do anything financially. They're excluded from many councils. They're outnumbered by men. I also think it's interesting that women have to go to men in order to receive exaltation. Like you have to go to a man to get your temple recommend. You have to go to another man to 
like have all these things done. The only thing that women have to do with women is seems to be in the, wa the initiatory, the washing and anointing and stuff. And that's only because we don't have very many clothes on. Well, we don't well, now nowadays the temple has changed it so that you are wearing clothing. But yeah, back so. in the day, <laughs> back in the day, one of my favorite stories. So back in the day, the washing and anointing was not like it is today where they put a drop of water on your forehead. They literally gave you a full on bath. They scrubbed you head to toe. They put oil on you head to toe. Like anyway, yeah. so Annalisa Young described it as the oil dripping into her eyes. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that's one of the reasons why women are doing this for the women so that uh, because it, because it, it's so it's such an intimate thing. Yeah. To be doing full on bathing and, and anointing their whole body. Yeah, And Annalisa talks about how when she was going going through and getting washed, she there was just like a sheet in the room and she could hear the bat the men splashing in the bathtubs on, on their the side, side of the sheet getting washed. So anyway, so that's so that the one place where the women are acting on behalf of the women, like they're not answering to a man is during these intimate moments. So like we'll allow that to happen, but you guys can't. Which is ridiculous. Like the when I thought I, when I went through the temple the first time and a woman blessed me i was like like i was blown away i was so excited i was like this is the best thing ever i didn't know women could do this it's been a secret all this time oh we don't talk about what we do in the temple it's because they give women power for a second in the temple i had the opposite feeling because it was so out of norm to me because like women cannot have this priest or women cannot have the priest and i was like oh, what are you doing like this is wrong like mm -hmm. <laughs> i was very opposite of that but um, I was like, Dad, what's going on? Why are the women doing this? And he was like, oh, well, they can in the temple. I'm like, no idea that women did this all the time in the early years of the church. But anyway, sorry. That they should be able to still. But Yeah, but. Water. Yeah. yeah. So there, this is the last slide that I have. This is the Relief Society today. So um, the, for the age of the Relief Society, the church says it is one of the oldest and largest women's organizations in the world. Um, again, they don't talk about the 20 years absence and it's not really a women's organization. It's not a women led organization. I guess you could say it is an organization of women that is run by a man. I don't know how technically, it's, uh, technically, like, like technically, sure. They, they have their like society presidents and the counselors, mm -hmm. but they answer to men, right? They answer to men. Their funding is controlled by men. If anything is, um, un unhappy in relief society a man is the one who will come mm -hmm. in and fix it yeah so to me that feels like it's run by a man so the membership this is today the the membership is 7 million members in over 188 countries and territories so again this is automatic these are women who are not not all these women are active in the church um yeah just okay um the purpose general the purpose of relief society is the gospel instruction women women's find women's and familial support and humanitarian aid. It is run by men. Can it be called a women's organization if it is run by men, which is we talked about earlier? I don't know. I, I don't, I wouldn't call it a women's organization, but it is an organization with it's women. It's an organization it. for women. Oh, I don't know. How, well, okay. Um, auxiliary. The early society is an auxiliary, which literally means subsidiary or less important. Um, again, I don't think this is what Joseph imagined whenever he set up the early society. He called it he said it needs a partner, partner or parallel to the priesthood. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So any final thoughts? <laughs> this always makes me really frustrated because you can see how big they were. They were just, they were just powerful. rocking everything. Like they're, yeah, very they powerful. Influence. They were talking to each other. They were making, like, they had money. They could help each other. They had their own food store. You know how much they pre press food storage and they had, hundreds of thousands of bushels of grain mm -hmm. in their own food storage. They were independent and it was just taken away. Yeah. We were just discussing before this, how, what it would look like if the church had not taken any of those things away. Like if the relief study had been able to keep its grain, had been able to keep its ability to make, to earn money and, and to have its own periodicals, it would just be so, I don't even know what to even imagine. They would just be so different today. It would, the church would be run differently. If we're, if we're honest, it like that <laughs> all those lawsuits that are coming against them right now would not look the same because if women had control of the their their own money, if not you know influence in the whole church's financial system, people would be getting taken care of mm -hmm. rather than just stockpiling money. Mm -hmm. Like well, but also like the women were in, in these periodicals, the women were educating themselves, like this other woman, Amy Lyman. 
um, where she's like, well, they need to learn about their, their, um, the polls, the, uh, who to elect and like what, like educating them in every single way. The women, not that are, these women, not that the women of the church are not educated, but like, it would just be so different. They would like having in one periodical that can help you. Like, I don't know, that would just be really, really neat to go or, to. And, or supported in education. Like, and like just where, in general, what were yeah. you taught as far as going to school? So I was taught that a women's education is not important almost at all. Like a woman should learn how to take care of her kids, take care of her husband. That's it. Learn how to cook, clean. Like she doesn't need to go get a degree. Like my family really pushed. They're like, you don't, you don't need to get your degree. You don't have to go to school. Like, why are you doing this? Like, mm -hmm. oh, or, or just go to a technical college and learn a basic skill or something like, I don't know my, all of the, so we both went to BYU Idaho. We both did get our degrees. Um, but we were like everyone, everyone around us was getting a degree that they could do as a wife and a mother. Like their priority was wife and a mother. And then if I can do this thing that I love and adore and could be really good at and could make a career in, oh, I'll just do that on the side. Like, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, having, no, no, having, if the Relief Society maintained its auto autonomy, then I think the women today would be, would, there would be, there would be very little to no sexism in the church. Like, I don't know how, like, the women could continue giving blessings to the sick, to their family, or like uh, everything would be so different. Like it'd be really they would have, to... they would have, um, like young girls would have people to look up to who have, who are leaders, who have control over a situation, who like can teach them how to be a leader rather than, I don't know, the leaders that we have are, are sweet and good and kind, but they don't have any power. Like if you were to say, um, like one of the, one of the complaints that my that my sister had um, about young women's was that there was like no nothing fun nothing interesting like we had a lot of makeovers we learned how to make clothes we had chili cookoffs like a lot of very like homemaker style um, projects to learn and we one time for girls camp we went to a boys like a boy scout camp. And there was like, um, uh, what are those called? The, the, the zip, there was like a zip line and like a, the high, high walk thing. There was like a high obstacle course thing with a zip line at the end. There was lakes with canoes. I mean, this was like a full on, like something you would see in the movies. Whereas the girls camp that we went to was literally, um, there was like a building that had bathrooms and showers in it. And then there was spots, like there was, um, I'm trying to think of the word, where, where you put a fire. Fire pit? What are you talking about? Yeah, there um, was places to put fires in like, I don't know, six different locations spread out around this valley. There was literally nothing else there. There was, there was a stage where we could do like our fun stuff. And that was the... The height. Yeah, that's how it that's was the too. There was like we did crafts and sang songs and made food and like that right. was there was no and how cruel that the girls who love the, those activities, the climbing, the canoeing, like and I don't know about you, loved it, enjoyed it immensely, and would have loved to go back, but we don't get to make those decisions. And even if we said to our young women's counselors or our leaders. Hey, we will raise money to be able to go back to that um, that camp. They would have had to say no. The leaders will not. The bishopric will not support you going back there. The yeah. only reason they sent us there is because um, uh, where our girls' camp was, um, right over the mountain, um, a weed farm got caught, and it, the whole mountain was shut down because of it. Wow. Yeah. Um. So so on this note, I wanted to mention also. So there was a ward clerk um, who put these numbers on ex Mormon Reddit, I think. And he was talking about how the church literally makes the women's. So they have a, an, an amount of money on everyone's head. And so that's how they, they count them all. They count all the men, the young men, they count all the young, young women, they count all the primary, they count all the grown men, the women. And they give an amount that the church is allowed per how many or per what type of person member they are. And so like for the men, it's, I can't remember the exact amounts, but for the young men, it's, it's a higher number. 
And for the women, it's a much, for the young women, it's a much lower number. So they're like, they're valuing them at like $6 where the boys are like $12. I can't remember the exact numbers, but We're again, literally not worth as much, right? The women are not worth as much as far as these church budgets are. And then like me, I was in the, um, the young women's presidency and I was over the beehives. And like, so one thing that I was trying to push is cause like, it's, it was important to me as a member of the church or as a young girl to get my, the medallion. Um, and you have to go through, you have to go through this whole book of, of tasks and mm -hmm. you have to fill them out. And so I was really helping like every activity I was like pushing for my girls to, to get this achievement. Cause it was like, like one of the only achievements that they have set up for the girls. Like yep. there's the like nothing thing to strive for. Right. So I was pushing for them and all of them were like, learn to sew this thing or learn to set the table or like really silly or learn to cook this meal. Like, like such homemaker things. And I was like, this is so boring. The girls are so bored. And they're like, these are little 12 year old, uh, 13 year olds. And anyway, so one day I got my archery set out and I was like, you guys, we're just going to go shoot arrows. And they all loved it. And like, it's, that's sort of a masculine thing, uh, an activity, but the girls all loved it. And I think it's so dumb that but we I don't value think archery less. is really masculine. Like of all the, the fighting, like, like uh, wielding a sword much harder for a woman archery like you don't have to be that strong to pull an arrow and and i took an archery class in college and my teacher said that the best shot he'd ever seen the the person who it was was a pregnant woman wow because her balance was different because of the way her body sat because she's pregnant so that's cool so if that archery <laughs> being masculine okay well i was trying i was doing my best but... you did great Good job. <laughs> Go you. Um, anyway, so I, I just think that so even today we're still seeing I this is how I'm gonna say it. I'm, I'm just gonna own it. The we're still seeing today that the church is very sexist. The church is valuing women less. The the church has taken all of the important parts of, of relief society and just pulled it out, just gutted it. Like you guys can't have your own finances, you can't have your own voice in, in your periodicals. You like everything is gone from it. So it's just the women go to get so I didn't even realize it was this big of a deal. It's just like this is you just go to this class and then you go home. You go to this class every Sunday and then you go home. It's not really an organization. It's just a pretend thing. Yeah. I, uh, I We're not really relieving anyone. Yeah, like, exactly. I, I remember joining it when I joined it when I was 18. I was like, why is this called Relief Society? Why isn't it just called like women's? women's? Class. <laughs> like like right. this is like we have the priesthood and then we have just the women's. Like why mm -hmm. is it Relief Society? And like what a weird name. Like what are we relieving? Like why, how is this a society of any kind? Like it didn't make yeah. sense. And that's because it's been gutted and it is not what it was when it was named. Yeah. Anyways. So on that note, um, um, please like, and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Um, if you want to donate, you can donate in the, I think uh, YouTube has allowed this, like, um, what is it called to donate through YouTube? I don't know how, I can't remember what that's called. Um, you can also donate on the website and you can go, you can follow me on Patreon or TikTok. And, and if you love studying church history, like Julia does, then you should <laughs> sign up for our top tier on Patreon because we give you a free book. Oh yeah. Yeah. We have a lot of books we can give you. We have wife number 19, we have William Smith on Mormonism. Uh, John Dealey's not quite out yet, but we're getting there. Oh, it's, it's so close to being out. It's just, I'm having like technical issues. It's messed up with the new book that we're putting out, um, on our, on the queer side, queer book side of our publishing company, um, which we're publishing um, our first queer book in February. It's called and Outsider. And the pre-orders are up? Mm, pre-orders for the um, ebook is up. The physical book is what I'm having trouble with. Right. And they, for some reason, they keep conflicting. I don't know. It's, I'm. Our author is this amazing woman from New Zealand. I'm yeah. super excited for it's this. Such a book, good, so. like she's won awards. It's, it's great. I'm super excited. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> But yeah, so um, on a different note, like Annalise's book, Wife Number 19, I think every Mormon, so ex-Mormon and Mormon active member of the church should read that book. Like it's she's so such a great good. storyteller. <laughs> she writes so well. Like yeah. anyway. Um, yeah. So thanks for joining us and talking about the Relief Society and how crappy the history is. Um, yeah. I hope you're as angry as we are. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>